Good evening, everyone. Welcome to this, the third event this week um, on Stirling Photography Festival Flow 21. Tonight, we have the great pleasure of introducing a great friend of um, Stirling Photography Festival, um, Tom Bowser from Argentia Red Kite Centre. A great friend of mine and from a family who have done so much to encourage wildlife and show that you can succeed with wildlife and conservation alongside making a living from a working farm. Argety is a haven for photographers, for those of you who might be wondering why Tom's giving the talk in a photography festival. They have hosted in, um, in 2019 two wonderful workshops with the local photographer Mandy Williams. These were extremely successful and sold out almost immediately. We've had lots of different workshops over the, over the, the last few years. Also, Tom has recently become a best-selling author. And Tom, please feel free to shamelessly plug your book because it's a great read. Okay, on you go, Tom. We're looking forward to this. Okay, just to check before I start, can everyone see the screen okay? Excellent, that's great. Okay, well, first of all, um, to just say thank you very much to Anne for the introduction and um, to her and Janie for inviting me along tonight. Tonight, folks, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my home, Argety, and some of the work that we do for wildlife on the place. Um, for those of you who don't know Argety, we are a 1,400-acre beef and sheep farm located between Dune and Dunblain, and the farm has been home to my family since 1916. Those of you that do know us may know us for our red squirrel hides, our dragonfly and other wildlife walks. But most likely, if you have heard of us and if you have been to us, it will be because of our Red Kite project. My parents, Lynn and Neil, founded Argety Red Kites in 2003 in partnership with the RSPB. The RSPB and Scottish Natural Heritage had been reintroducing these birds across the UK, trying to bring them back to our skies. And Central Scotland was the fourth release site so German birds were being brought over and released as chicks to the two estates to the immediate west of Argety. And they all seemed to like our farm more than the release sites that they were being brought to. So they came over, started gathering on Argety and never left. In their wake came a whole, whole host of bird watchers keen to get a glimpse of a bird that had been extinct in our area for over a century. Now my parents were faced with two choices at that time. We clearly needed to protect the birds from people that still would do them harm. And what was the best way to do that? People had pushed them into extinction in the first place, mistakenly believing that these birds were terrible predators, when in fact they're scavengers. How to protect them? Either we could try and keep it all quiet, keep them hidden away, or they could invite people in, let them come and see the birds and appreciate them and hopefully have less tolerance for those that would still harm them. Thankfully, they chose the latter, and each day since then, our rangers have provided a small amount of food for the kites, just enough to top up what they can find in the wild, not so much that they would ever become tame, dependent on the food, or would stop spreading out and recolonizing old haunts. And we've invited people to our viewing heights to come and learn about the birds, watch their spectacular flying, the diving, feeding, and occasionally fighting, and to learn their amazing history. Now, when Anne, who has been a friend of mine now for a number of years, I'm happy to say, asked me to do a talk tonight, I of course said yes straight away. Then she told me that the theme of the photography festival was flow, and I thought, oh, thanks, mate. Because what does somebody from a predominantly land-based conservation project say about flow? So I gave it some thought, and I decided to base tonight's talk on the flow of time to think about the work that we do in different seasons of the year and how things done in one season will go on to affect the next. So I begin tonight's journey with the season that's fast approaching us, autumn, which is a time of real change on the farm. 
The grass is growing over, starting to droop. In the morning, cobwebs glisten in our wildflower meadows. The last of the summer migrants head south. And in many ways, autumn is my favorite period in the year. For one thing only, this glorious halo of light that we get in the last hours of the day. A light so perfect that even sheep look good in it. For red kites, this is a very interesting and changing time as well. Having finished rearing their chicks, the birds enter into their annual molt, replacing old broken flight feathers and growing them anew. Watching them each day, we have the joy of seeing the young kites from, the, from this year coming out and finding food for the first time, taking their first steps in the wild. In the woods, our squirrels are working hard, coming and finding as much food as they can to cash for the winter when the supplies will be sorely needed. For us on the farm, this is perhaps the last chance that we can do the vital conservation work that we'll need for the seasons ahead. This is my friend Alan Jones up a ladder installing one of our kestrel boxes last year. And our volunteer Sandra planting aspen trees around our ponds in the last days before the frost made the ground too hard. We get the last of our rehabbed animals from wildlife charities like Hesselhead and the SSPCA and try and get them out and used to life in the wild before the cold sets in as well. A truly magical time of the year for us and one of the real privileges of the job. Then the cold does come and Arcti really begins to change. There we go. The wildflowers skate across the frozen ponds. We see the return of the winter migrants like Redwing, Field Fair, and these waxwings coming back from the trees around us. On my work, walk to work, I'm often greeted by the charming tinkling of goldfinch in our wildflower meadow coming down and feasting on burdock and other plants that traditionally people have viewed as weeds, but which are so vital for wildlife. Our sheep move across the frozen fields looking for any last scraps of food to eat. On the hill, our cows are doing some vital work in the winter time, trampling down rushes, eating the tusky grass, and also chewing the decaying heads of orchids and spreading their seeds through their manure. For red kites, winter is a very intense period. The birds that nested on higher ground, when it becomes too cold at altitude, they come down to the farm at a lower altitude and join a big communal pack that stay here over the winter time. Also returning are young birds who will be looking for a partner for the first time in preparation for the following spring. In the daytime, they go out braving all sorts of elements, flying in together in search of food. In normal times, we may only see 20, 25 kites coming in, but as the weather gets worse, the number grows and grows, so that in the most intense of winter weather, we could see 60 or 70 kites coming down for food. And at night, when all the action's over, the birds take to the skies, circle around over the farm, then one by one disappear off into the trees to sleep together, all set for the next day when they'll come out in a pack again to find food. In many ways, kites are an unusual bird of prey, a bird that defies that lone wolf idea that we have of raptors. These birds are much more comfortable being in a group, coming and finding food together. And part of the reason for that perhaps is that Particularly in bad weather, they face real competition from other birds for the scraps that we put out and other supplies that they might find in the wild. Part of the reason that winter is so intense is that buzzards, youngsters that have dispersed from other areas, will often come and find our food. And they'll come and hunker over it, mantling it, trying to protect every last scrap they can find, shooing off and fighting off any kites that dive down around them. So for kites, it makes sense to have safety in numbers. The other competition we often see coming in when the ponds freeze over is herons. Although whether 
they're more of a threat to kites or to one another is debatable. For our red squirrels, winter can be a tough period and I always feel glad that we reached the decision a couple of years ago to start feeding squirrels across the farm. It's a common misconception that these animals hibernate in winter, but that's in fact not true. What they'll do is they'll try and lay low in their drays and conserve energy so then they're not using up precious reserves going out and braving the cold. So in normal years, when it really starts to get, the chill really sets in, these animals, which may be quite territorial at other times of year, suddenly become very much more communal. And it's not uncommon for two or three squirrels to curl up in a dray together, wrapping the tails around one another like sleeping bags and trying to get each other through that period. And when they venture out, they'll only come for food, try and pick up supplies that have been cached over the autumn period, and then they'll get back to the dray where it's safe and warm. Spring arrives on us and it's always a huge relief for us and for the wildlife. Winter in Scotland is such a hard period and I think no more so than in the countryside where we really feel it the most. So when spring comes, we all breathe a sigh of relief. A floral explosion takes over our woods in this period. It begins with daffodils and snowdrops. And then last of this explosion is a massive carpet of bluebells that sweep over the woodlands here. There are many nice times to see Argety, but there's no doubt that that brief period, that matter of weeks in the springtime when all of this is happening is the most spectacular. The red squirrels emerge largely unscathed, thankfully, to our hides still sporting the winter ear tufts, which some will keep year round, but some will molt out when they get their summer coats. Our hedgerows come alive with song. And our ponds are busy too. In recent years, my wife, daughter and I have begun a project to try and move as many frogs, toads and newts as we can find in springtime take them off the roads where they're likely to be run over and get them to the ponds where they can breed in safety. In the last three years, we must have moved in the region of 700 and the effect on the ponds is amazing. They'll be pulsing with action, with frogs mating, spawn being laid and eventually rippling with tadpoles that have hatched. It's always a relief to see those rehabilitated animals that the wildlife charities brought to us, coming out from the winter unscathed, coming in for food that we set out in the woods. And there's another relief for me on a personal note in that I get to see my friend Keith Burgoyne again when spring comes. Keith and I spend much of the year out in the woods over spring and summertime, trying to monitor any owls, ravens or breeding raptors that we can find on Argety. It's a very intense draining period where we're out in all weathers trying to do as much as we can. And then over autumn and winter, everything goes quiet and Keith and I may barely speak for months. But when the weather improves, Keith comes out and he's up the trees again, installing and repairing nest boxes and getting us ready for the nesting seasons ahead. We do all of our work as part of the Scottish Raptor Monitoring Scheme, one of the largest citizen science projects in the world. Our aim is to find nests and monitor them. And then when the chicks within them are big enough to fit leg rings to them, identification rings, which all this data will be fed into the monitoring scheme and is used to inform decision makers on the breeding health of our raptors, to learn about where things are so that then any harmful developments like forestry or housing that might impact on these birds can be avoided. One of the biggest and most important things that's being done in conservation at the moment. We begin with ravens, one of the earliest nesters. And it's always a surprise to see how quickly these birds grow, how swiftly the great beak the massive red tongue develops 
Always a surprise to see them. Next come tawny owls, and we have them breeding in abundance in our nest boxes in most years. Sadly, this year has been a poor year for tawny owls with the, with the cold sting at the end of May preventing many of them from breeding. But in normal years, Arctic is a great place for the tawnies and we hope we'll return to something more like normality in the year to come. Other raptors that breed later begin to appear and we start to monitor to see which ones are on territory. My friend Alan Jones took this wonderful picture of kestrels hovering, feeding around the nest box that we'd installed the previous winter. And after months of waiting, hoping that they'll return, it's been a big thrill for the past three years to have ospreys coming back and breeding on Argety. Kites too begin to depart our land, moving off to their own separate breeding sites. Some stay here, but some are breeding as far as 70 miles away from us now, really showing the success of this. Of all of the UK's rewilding stories, the growth of the kite population has perhaps been the most impressive. Then comes summer, the final season, where our work reaches its culmination. In our wildflower meadows, bees, bumblebees, butterflies and dragonflies are buzzing around. On the hill, the gorse is in full flower. Looking at this picture, you can perhaps imagine the smell of coconut in the air and the sound of birdsong. Again, gorse, a bit like some of the plants I mentioned earlier, is something that farmers have traditionally frowned upon, something that takes over grazing land. But there's no doubt that for wildlife, it's such an important resource, such an important thing to have. And we allow the gorse to run fairly rampant on the hill because we know what good it can do. You may remember a few slides earlier, I showed you cows up on the hill, told you about the work they were doing on there. In May, we take the cows off the hill just in time for the wildflowers to start blooming. And what a scene it is up there, all sorts of colors with orchids, ragged robin, meadow pea, and other wonderful wildflowers coming out on there. All of this, I'm convinced, has been created by the cows when they do their work of trampling down the rushes, eating the grasses, so these things won't outcompete these precious wildflowers. And what a result we have. Sometimes I feel that this good side of farming has been left out in some of the white noise that surrounds meat production at the moment. There's no doubt that a dynamic ecosystem needs grazers. It always has had them and it needs grazers doing what they do. This sort of scene is the benefit that we reap here. Argety has always been a good place for hares. And after the madness of March with all the chasing and boxing, Thankfully, by the summertime, we are seeing a more sedate animal, one that's more relaxed in the fields. Another benefit we see in the summertime is the number of frogs and toads that we can find in the pond. And it presents us with a good opportunity for my daughter Rowan and I to engage in one of our favorite games, trying to hypnotize a frog. Now, I don't know if you know this, Anne's familiar with it from some of our photography workshops. But if you stare right into the eyes of a frog or a toad, they won't move. They'll sit staring right back at you. And although I didn't tell Rowan that she was going to be in this presentation and she'd be horrified if she knew <laughs> that you were all looking at it just now, one of the great pleasures we have is sitting and watching these animals, which you feel may not have been in there, at least not in such number had we not moved them from the roads in earlier seasons. Certainly when I was a child growing up here, I always remember driving home late at night in that early spring period and trying to avoid all the frogs and toads. And there were so many that it was really impossible. There were always some that were run over, but by moving them, I think we're creating something of a bottom-up ecosystem in those ponds. And it's nice to see them coming out again in the summertime. Our San Martin colony 
is always impressive and seems to grow every year. Here is the excavated bank of an old quarry on Argety. And mum and I enjoyed some wonderful views of them last year, shooting in and out of their burrows on this relentless flight to catch insects and bring them back to the chicks. A wonderful bird to see. In recent years, we began several nest box projects around the farm, trying to provide habitat for another one of our favorite small birds, the tree sparrow. When I was growing up, I don't really remember tree sparrows being on Argety. Um, in fact, across the UK, they've been in massive decline, largely as a result of farmland changes, hedgerows and gorse being removed, the sort of places that these birds like to nest. Also, no doubt the removal of old hollow trees has had a big impact on birds big and small. So we have tried to replicate that nesting habitat, planting lots of hawthorns, blackthorns, allowing the gorse to run rampant, and also supplying nest boxes where they can safely start their families. And the result has been wonderful. Now we have close to 100 nest boxes on Argety. And this year we had 15 broods, no, 18 broods, I tell like 18 broods of tree sparrows in there, as well as all sorts of blue tits, cool tits, great tits. So the numbers are increasing every year thanks to the habitat created. And one of my favorite sights in the morning is seeing them sitting, waiting for us to top up the bird feeders by our red kite hide. Another favorite memory I have is of the moment when the chicks fledge. Usually we get two broods of tree sparrows and it's such a delight to see them coming out into those hawthorn bushes, which weren't there a few decades ago for them, but are now sitting and cheeping away and begging to their parents for food in the same way that a child might cry themselves asleep, we see a similar thing with the baby tree sparrows. They shriek so much until finally <laughs> they've worn themselves out and the head just droops beneath their wing and they pass out for a short time. I don't know if this is the sparrow version of controlled crying, but it seems to work for a few moments anyway. Red squirrels emerge in the summer and it's so interesting to see the reaction that people have to them. Again, like the misconception that squirrels hibernate in winter, there's always a feeling that things like squirrels and birds fare well in the summer when there should be an abundance of food for them. Actually, squirrels do quite badly in the summertime. There isn't that much for them. And so our supplies, I think, become even more crucial to them even more important. So we see them coming in growing numbers. If the weather has been kind over the winter and early spring period, we might get a couple of litters. This year, because of the spring, sadly, it's only been one litter that's come out, but their number thankfully has been boosted by a couple of releases by the SSPCA bringing out orphan squirrels to join our wee population at our heights. And what a joy to see them taking their first steps of freedom here always noticeable with them, although they look more or less the same as the squirrels that we've had here for a few years, you can always notice the difference just because they are so clueless when they're first released into the woods, go ping-ponging about between trees, not really sure what to do in the wild, just delighted to be free. So that's a real excitement. Keith and I set to the real intense period of work in our raptor monitoring come the early period of June, fitting leg rings to kestrels, to buzzards, to barn owls, and of course to red kites. Now for kites, summer is a very interesting and intense period not traditionally viewed by some photographers as the most exciting time of year. We have some photographers that we only see in the winter time when we have the big numbers of kites, beautiful snow reflected light hitting them. So they look spectacular. But in many ways, winter is actually less interesting to me than the spring and early summer period when these birds are feeding chicks. I told you earlier that these birds were traditionally viewed as a threat to 
things like game birds and lambs. In reality, they are largely scavengers hunting only for small prey like insects and rodents. Um, and certainly, as you can see here, the idea that they could be a threat to livestock is <laughs> clearly being disproven by the reaction of the sheep in the background of this shot. Um, similarly, with game birds, kites don't come and take them. But sadly, this misconception spread through the Victorian era and these birds were killed, out in, killed off in huge numbers. There are some reasons why people might have had this misconception, and I think it might have been in large part because of the way that the birds act in the nesting season. When these birds have young to feed, they become a very different bird to the one that we see the rest of the year very fearless, although they're never particularly worried about people, they abandon all fear when they've got young to feed and they'll dive down and practically take our heads off when we chuck out their small daily feed. Desperate to come and just provide as much as they can for the young back in the nest. Perhaps then when people were seeing this bird, seeing this fearless scavenger coming in, that is what gave rise to the idea that they were always fearless. And people perhaps saw that five foot wingspan, put two and two together and made five and thought that the birds were dangerous. But in actual fact, all this work is being done for these guys, the red kite chicks. Keith and I tried to get out to fit the leg rings to them in the second week of June. That's always red kite ringing week. By that point, the kites should be about four to five weeks old about halfway through their development when they'll be fully grown and ready to fledge the nest by seven or eight weeks. So we aim to get to them at the point where they're big enough to have enough of a leg to take a leg ring on it. Not so big that they're thinking about building up their wing strength and we risk flushing them from the nest before they're ready to fly. So we take them out, fit the leg rings, we'll take measurements from them as well so we know how many male kites we have, how many females and feed this all back into the database. As well as the kites, we've had the big thrill of having our ospreys here the last few years. And where kites are still quite a dainty bird, which indeed they'll remain even into adulthood, the ospreys are a different beast altogether. Taking a far bigger leg ring, which needs a bigger size of pliers to be fitted. Um, and you can see even from this picture, those massive legs and talons perfectly designed for gripping fish and taking them back to the nest. At the moment, our young ospreys are still here, still circling around the nest, learning to fly with their dad. They'll probably be here, I would imagine a matter of days more, not much longer. And then they'll begin the big flight down to Africa where they'll stay for a few years until they're ready to come back, try and find a territory and mate. And part of me, although there's a real sadness to these birds leaving, particularly now that we have a nest camera on the nest and have been following their movements throughout the year, there's part of me that loves the idea that our little farm in this small part of Scotland has this big connection to the wider world. That means a lot to me. Folks, I've got one more story I'd like to tell you about our work through the seasons, and it involves a surprise find that we had in the raptor season this year. When walking through a remote wood on Argety one time, looking for a buzzard nest to see if it was still occupied from previous years, I heard a sound ahead of me. The sound that was unmistakably a bird of prey calling, but not one that I recognized, not one that I'd heard before. In the distance looking up, I saw this shape, something roughly the size of a buzzard perhaps, moving silently off through the trees. A few days later, Keith came out and climbed the tree, at the foot of which were a couple of feathers, which I knew, again, weren't belonging to any bird of prey that I'd seen. And when Keith climbed the tree, he confirmed that we had our first goshawk nest that I had found ever found here, the first breeding goshawks that we knew of for 10 years from back in the time when we had another head ranger running the place. And a few weeks later, we would go out and ring the chicks. Now, initially we had two chicks in the nest, but by the time we went out to fit the leg rings, 
one was gone, eaten by the older sister here, a very common thing that raptors do in order to make sure that one chick survives healthy, they tend to lay more than they need a few days apart so that then if food supplies are scarce, the bigger one will at least make it out. And that indeed is what's happened here. Now, for those of you who may not know much about goshawks, they are a very secretive and mysterious bird, one that tends to shun people and civilization and live in the remote edges of our countryside, a bird that very few people will ever see. They're a ferocious hunter, and this picture perhaps doesn't do justice to the length of these birds' talons. Certainly, all I can do is describe the way that these birds hunt, jinking almost like an owl through the trees, silently coming in to ambush prey. They're a bird that can take small prey and also larger things like well-grown leverets. Even in recent years, red kites have been killed by them here. So a bird that is a serious, serious predator, at least by British standards. When I posted the picture of this bird online, it interested me the reaction that we received. Most people were just bowled over to see this bird because most people have never seen them. Most people in our nature depleted country are, I guess, quite impressed to see a predator in our midst because we have so few of them. But there was another side to it. Um, other people who felt that there were too many of them, that they were responsible for the decline in things that we maybe remember from recent decades being higher in number, birds like kestrels, for example. Now, it's fairly obvious to me that those things are going down because of what people are doing, the changes that we're making to the countryside in the way that we farm it, the intensity of that, the intensity of our forestry, you know, that to me is so obvious, it's almost not worth arguing about. And that's not really the point that I suppose I want to end on. The point I want to finish on really is what this bird makes me think about the work that we are doing on the farm. To me, I wish I could prove that there was a link between some of the things I've shown you tonight, the nest boxes, the wildflower meadows, the cows on the hill, the gorse, and a predatory bird. I really wish I could prove one. Of course, there's no way that I can say directly that by sowing wildflower meadows, we have a hawk here. Of course I can't, but I believe that it's so. I believe that by building things from the ground up, as we have done, we've created a farm that is full of life, still producing food, but very full of life. And when a place is full of life, of course, you won't just get the small things, you'll get the bigger things coming to feed on the small things. So I believe that this bird being here is a sign that we are hopefully doing something right as a farm, managing to achieve our two goals of producing food and also making our home a home for wildlife. So I think this bird, I hope it's a sign of success that we are doing some things right. That the flow of the seasons, the things we're doing in the autumn and winter and spring will have this knock on effect for the summer and that things are going well. So folks, to end, Anne said that it was okay for me to do a very obvious plug. <laughs> so here we go. If any of you would like to know more about the work that we're doing, the book is out now. I won't say any more about that, except that it's available in all the normal places. But really what I would like to encourage you to do, if you haven't been before, is to pay us a visit and to follow us on social media. We're on all the normal channels that a man approaching 40 is able to work. So no TikTok, but everything else we're on. And please do come and pay us a visit. It's a great time to see the kites. Every season is interesting for them and for the squirrels. All of our work is funded by visitor contributions. We're not a charity. We don't take money from anywhere else. So it all relies on people coming to see us and to learn about them. And I hope that by doing so, you'll appreciate the work we're doing and the animals that we're supporting here. But folks, thank you again for listening to me tonight. And I'll round up there. And if anyone wants to ask questions, I will stop my share. Yep, there's been a few questions come in just as you were talking about summer and the last story there. 
Um, I'll just go through them, if you like. That's perfect, Megan. Thank you. Um, Anne just asked at the start, um, are the kites and squirrels dependent on the food that you put out for them? So, no, they're not is a short answer. Yeah, thank you, Anne. I knew you were going to plant a few good ones. That's a crack <laughs> to start off. Um, no, we try very much to make sure that we're not making the wildlife dependent on anything here. With kites, Anne and I have actually talked about this quite a lot of times and about the balance that you have to try and strike. The thing with kites is because they're largely scavengers, um, they are pretty much always relying on food that people supply, whether deliberately or unintentionally. So if they don't come to our food, they'll tend to go to busy roads, train tracks, wind farms and shooting estates, all places with inherent dangers for them. So we think that by providing a small amount of food, just enough to top up what they're finding in the wild, we can make a small hub that will support a small number of kites and keep them safe. That's what we're aiming to do with that. Similarly, with the squirrels, we're just trying to provide a small amount of food to top them up. Part of um, the reason that we've engaged in this is something that we didn't tend to talk about before, but we maybe do a bit more now, is that we're in a really crucial area in this part of Scotland for red squirrel conservation, a real dividing line between the red populations to the north and the grey populations to the south. And in fact, when I was growing up here, Argety was grey squirrel only. They'd moved in and the reds had really been pushed to the margins. Um, so what we're trying to do in various ways is to boost red populations around this area. Part of that is with feeding the red squirrels, part of it as well, and this is the part we didn't used to talk about so much, is grey squirrel control. Um, we, a lot of people don't like the idea of culling grey squirrels, which I completely understand. Um, it's not something that sits comfortably with me either, but um, where you have grey squirrels, you don't have reds, as it has been proven across all areas south of us in Scotland, more or less, and almost completely in England as well. Um, the greys either push the reds out of their territories and they're left to starve, or um, some carry the squirrel pox virus, which they're immune to, but which they pass on to reds, and the reds die over a two to three week period in a slow, painful way. So we do a bit of quick and as humane as possible culling of greys here, but the net result of that is that the red squirrel population has rebounded and we now have so many of them here, which is a real conservation win. So a happy sight to this unfortunate thing that we have to do. Um, so again, yeah, with the feeding, this is just another part of trying to really boost red squirrel numbers in this area and see that they keep on making a comeback and pushing further south from here again. Um, Elaine has asked, do you find you need to put more food out in the winter for them? We haven't ever, Elaine. Um, we've always tried to avoid that. Um, really just to try and keep things as natural as possible. And that there is a downside to that. that the first winter can be very hard for young kites in particular to just, you know, recently out the nest and still trying to find their feet in the world. Um, a lot of young kites won't make it through their first winter, but that, of course, is entirely natural. And if they don't make it through, then perhaps their carrion will supply other, other um, scavengers and keep them going. So, no, we try and keep it all just the same amount, really, just enough to keep a small population going here and not risk bringing in too many and then finding that they don't want to spread out and move back into other areas of Scotland again. Um, Janie has just asked, um, do kites predate at all or are they wholly scavengers also? Are they prey for any other animal? So they do, Janie, yeah. They um, will take small rodents, insects, amphibians. Um, possibly the biggest thing that a female kite being slightly bigger than a male might be able to take as a newly born rabbit. But to be honest, in all my time watching them here and they first arrived on the farm when I was 12, the only things I've ever seen them regularly feeding on are voles and also coming down and stamping the ground to mimic grain in the way that seagulls do to bring up worms. Really, that's all I've seen them hunting. I've seen some disastrous, disastrous attempts by them to try and hunt things like flocks of chaffinches, which get away from them quite easily. But no, they mainly are scavenging. In terms of things that can come and predate them, 
yeah, the landscape's actually changing quite a lot for them in this part of Scotland now in quite an exciting and unpredictable way. So pine martins can come and predate all sorts of young in the nest. You'll be a real danger. And the pine martin numbers had reached historic lows again, largely sadly because of gamekeeper persecution. But now they're rebounding and they're spreading back all over Scotland. And once they were the most common predatory mammal that we had in the UK and they're heading to be that way again. And so, yeah, they can cause a bit of fun for our nesting season. Um, the other thing, of course, is the goshawks. And um, yeah, now having seen a few goshawk kills in recent years, it's starting to make sense that these birds may have been in this area for longer than I realized, but were just so secretive that we'd never pick them up. Perhaps we were seeing or hearing reports of um, white-tailed eagles uh, moving closer to this area as well. And it's only a matter of time before they're over all of Scotland again. So again, that may be something else that kites have to fear when they move back in, yeah. Um, Lorna and Roger ask, have you noticed any changes in the seasons as climate change takes hold? Yeah, massively, guys, yeah. Um, I mean, in a way, it's almost kind of ironic to think of talking about the seasons as, as distinct things now. Um, a huge, huge change in all sorts of ways. I mean, um, one of the obvious ones was um, our Osprey camera this year. The many times we looked on the camera and saw the chicks panting almost like dogs on a hot day, tongues lolling out, the poor mother having to raise her wings and try and shelter them from the sun as best she can. It's been a tough year for a lot of raptors this year, albeit our season has been good and varied. We've been lucky here, but as mentioned earlier, the owls really struggled with the late spring, um, but late, winter, late snow and spring. Ospreys across the board have done poorly, largely because in this hot weather, fish have gone down deep into the water and a lot of the chicks aren't getting the moisture that they get, but they need from the fish because they can't be found. So a poor year for them. Yeah, all sorts of things are struggling. Um, another reason why we're moving so many amphibians to the ponds is that so many of them are drying out in puddles that the ones that we know are heading for the ponds, we want to try and boost their number to try and mitigate against that. Yeah. Uh, Lindsay asks, how often does your general farm work integrate with um, conservation work and would other farms be able to integrate conservation into their routines easily? Mm, that's a really good question, yeah. Um, yeah, we, the farm work ties together quite well with the farming. There's a lot of examples of things you can do that improve things for wildlife and also make your farming operation a lot easier. Um, so things like, you know, the gorse, there's no point us fighting the gorse, even if we were minded to on the hill. It gives shelter to our livestock. If you cut it back, it'll just grow again. Those farmers that are always trying to cut back the gorse, they're just going to be doing it forever. Similar thing um, in a field across the road from our Red Kite Centre, we had a corner that would always get boggy with a broken field drain filling up, which would be a real bad site for fluke, a parasite that affects our livestock. So rather than keep on fighting that, keep on having to medicate against it, my dad had the idea that we might as well just get the digger in, dig out a pond, be a win for livestock who wouldn't be suffering from fluke problems, it'd be a win for the wildlife as well. So things like that, these are things that are really easy to do. In a way, I suppose it's fighting with nature rather than against it. Um, no, that's a bad way of putting it. Stopping fighting against nature, that would be a better way of putting it. And just going with it um, makes so much sense in so many ways, you know, because um, there are some battles that you'll just never win. Um, other farms, I'm sure there are plenty of others that are already doing a lot for wildlife. Um, sometimes that's not really perhaps being recognized as much as it should be, I think, because so many people are panicked about the environment and crashing numbers in biodiversity and all these things and I think when you panic people want things to well, people to blame um, so perhaps that's part of the problem set against that we can't ignore the fact that wildlife in Britain is in as bad a place as it could possibly be and we're one of the most nature depleted countries in the world which to me was a real shock when I found that out recently 
It always seemed to me that we lived in this green and pleasant land where tourists flock to to see our wildlife, but actually the stats bear it out that we're in a bad place. And with about three quarters of our land being farmland, obviously there are big problems there. We know where the improvements have to be made. So yeah, I hope that they will. hope other farmers will start doing more. I hope that governments will realise the importance of incentivising this and making it possible for people who want to do more to do that. Yeah, I really hope that's going to be the direction of travel. Yeah. Um, another question from Elaine. Um, do you help the Osprey out with food too, or are they more independent? They're more independent, Elaine. Um, we have tried a few times to put out food for the Ospreys, but the issue that we have is that we are so Corvid and Raptor heavy here that um, something else always gets there before the Ospreys can. So really we just leave them to their own devices. I should have said earlier, um, we did help them out initially in that, um, our old head ranger, Mike, and Keith, our tree climber, um, were the ones that built the Osprey nest. It's an artificial nest that they're in. So. Beyond that, we've really left them to their own devices, but yeah, we did give them a helping hand at the start. Um, Leslie asks, just as you were talking about the owls earlier, um, that you didn't mention anything about barn owls. Um, how have they done this year? Again, a poor year for them, um, which is disappointing because last year was a very good one. Um, where we are, we sit on the braes of Dune and um, Argety gets to a decent altitude where it gets quite cold for barn owls in a bad year. So um, we really rely on a mild winter for them to do well. Um, and sadly, you know, that hasn't been the case this year. So we only ended up with one chick, one successful nest and one chick this year. Whereas last year we had three nests, one of which amazingly in a nest box, we went and climbed up to it and we just kept on pulling out chick after chick. There were six crammed into this tiny nest box. So a good year weather-wise, a good year for vol numbers as well meant that last year was great, but this year has taken a bit of a hit, sadly. Um, another question from Anne. Um, how many more species have you observed since you started adding more to ponds and planted the wildlife in the meadow? Well, the honest answer, Anne, is I really can't tell you because before that, I don't think I would have known what half the species we had here were. Um, a lot of um, the conservation work for me has been in recent times, and it's really, I think, kind of realizing how bad things were for wildlife in Britain came, as I say, as a real kind of shock to me. Um, so learning about them came on the back of that, I guess. So yeah, um, we are seeing more um, things like tree sparrows, as I mentioned earlier. Um, are increasing in number really well, and a lot of the raptor numbers are increasing well. We know that from previous data gathered by our old head ranger, but I think this place, you know, credit to my parents and to previous generations was in pretty good heart before I started doing any of this, you know, better than a lot of other farms. So a lot of this was here. It's really just that it's taken me a while to notice some of it. Um, Elaine again asks, um, would you consider asking people with ponds to help with the frogs and toads? She now has um, a pond and her neighbour has one too and would, and would be happy to help. There's a slight difficulty with this, Elaine. It's a really good question. Um, one of the main causes of mortality for amphibians is the spread of disease. And one of the big problems is people moving um, these things to these animals to ponds that they wouldn't originally be in, which causes a transference of disease. So if there is an obvious pond that we know that they're heading to, that's and there's an obvious crossing point, we have real clear crossing points for toads, for example, where they aren't going anywhere else, we know they're going there. That's a great thing to do. Yeah, go out with a bucket at night, pick them up and shift them over. It's a wonderful thing to do. I think sometimes, you know, if there's not an obvious place for them to go to, maybe just trying to get them across the road might be, if you can see roughly where they're heading, might be the best you can do, but actually putting them in the pond possibly could do more harm than good. So I think you just have to kind of use your intuition with that one. Yeah, definitely trying to get them away or try to put out signs or things like that, get them off the road and put out signs might be a good starting place. And if there's an obvious pond to go to, then yeah, definitely try and help out if you can. 
Um, a question from Susie. Um, you mentioned the importance of grazing animals on wildflowers. Um, with a push towards plant-based lifestyles, what would be the effect on the wildlife at Agrotay if you don't have any livestock? Oh, that's a cracker, yeah. Um, I mean, we we will always have livestock here. You know, um, I should say I have absolutely no problem with people moving to more of a plant-based diet. Um, I'm not one of those um, people in the countryside that's threatened by that. I think given how much meat, particularly unsustainably produced meat, um, people are eating worldwide, people trying to make decisions um, about um, the environment and how they live is all good. So I don't have a problem with that. But yeah, I think it, um, I think the cows in particular are at the real heart of the ecosystem here. Um, I think that's really borne out by the flowers that we see on the hill, by the birds that come and take beetles and beasties from the cow pats, all these sorts of things. You know, um, there's a real ecosystem up there, and I think cows are very much part of that. We've always had cattle or variants of that in the UK. So I think that's quite a natural thing. I guess as well, it's a weighing up of, um, of what you want to eat and how it's getting to your plate, which is a bit of a tricky one as well. You know, um, moving to a plant-based diet may have complications in Scotland where so much of our land is suitable only really for producing one thing and that's really for livestock farming you know with our climate that may change as climates change but you know um, then you face the choice of air miles for food and all these sorts of things so I don't think there's a right answer to it but I certainly think for here you know we're showing I hope that you can produce livestock and still make a good home for wildlife it doesn't have to be these extremes of either or um, mentioned from Anne again, education is high on your agenda. Can you touch on the net, on the nest box project with the local primary schools? I certainly can, especially seeing as you and Elaine helped us out so much with it. Yeah, um, we did a lovely nest box project, um, which um, was really well supported by some of our friends who are here tonight and volunteers for the kite project as well and members of the local community. Um, in the local villages, Dune and Deanston, um, a couple of friends of mine started up a climate action group trying to do what they could to address um, the problems that we all know we're having. And we were looking for an initial project to get started with, something that would, I guess, bear fruit immediately. You know, a lot of the things we're aiming to do, planting trees, sowing wildflowers, these things are all brilliant, but they take a while to really develop and um, bring rewards. So I had the idea that perhaps we could build nest boxes with the two local primary schools. If we could cut and pre-drill enough nest boxes for every pupil in the schools, um, then they could put them together, have a bit of ownership over the work that they're doing, and then take them home to put up in the gardens. And I think, and you might remember this better than I, to. So we started it just before the first lockdown, and I think we ended up with the schools building between 220 and 240 nest boxes and getting them out around the local area, which was exhausting at the time, but one of the things I'm really proud of, and I'm really glad that my friends came together to help me do it. It was a really nice thing to be involved in, and hopefully we'll have a bit of an effect until the habitat work that the group is doing comes into effect properly. Um, Claire asks, what is the next project you've got in mind? Well, at the moment, um, we are working on a few things. We're working on a new red squirrel hide so we can start doing daily tours, um, taking people out and showing them these animals, telling them a bit about their story in the same way that we do with the kites. Um, the big thing really, the one that has kind of occupied most of my time and attention for the last while is that we are applying to see if we can have beavers that would otherwise be culled in prime agricultural areas of Scotland moved to ponds on Argety and released here. Um, it's never been done before. There's been illegal or unintentional releases in Scotland. There was an official one done on the west coast of Scotland in Argyll 
in an area where the beavers are really, there's no escape from them there into a main river system, but there's never been beavers taken from conflict areas and released in a separate site in Scotland where they could enter the main river system. So it's been controversial. It's had a huge, huge amount of support, a small amount of quite vocal opposition from a lot of the people that really I perhaps expected to oppose it, but it's been quite exciting and we are due to get a decision in the coming weeks as to whether we get the go ahead from Nature Scott for it. It's um, our reasons for doing this, apart from the fact that um, we like beavers and find them interesting, there's been huge numbers of them culled under license in the last couple of years in Scotland. So um, a first in 2019, a fifth of the beaver population was killed. And then the stats are just out for the last year and 12% of the population were killed that year, which seems like a huge number when there might be other options available to move them to areas which are less valuable in farming senses. Um, in this area, some of you may know, but we are pretty well surrounded in the Stirling area by beavers already. We've got them down on the cars of Stirling in quite close to where Dobby's is. Um, they're in all the upper fourth catchments. They've swum on past here many times past our river end and never come up, damn them. Um, but they have been seen in Dune regularly. They're in around the Calendon Meadows, all sorts of places. So it's inevitable that they're going to come to Argety and to the neighbouring estates here anyway. And all the research that's been done on beavers shows that they're a massive, massive win for the environment that they create these wetland habitats, which boosts insect numbers, which then builds up the food chain from the bottom up. So bats, birds, amphibians, all sorts of things that feed on the insects benefit. Their wetlands are also a massive carbon sink. So I think that for the environment, we need as many beavers as we can in Scotland, and we have to try and find ways of accommodating them where we can. I'm not saying we can't ever cull them when they're causing problems, but I think we have to be better than this. I think we have to find ways because really it's our survival and our planet's survival that's on the line. So that's what we're doing. That's why we're doing it. And yeah, wish us luck on it. Um, Jamie just asks there, what is your opinion on the release of large, carniv uh, of large carnivores in Scotland? I think lynx, I, I think lynx may happen in our lifetime. I think it probably should happen. Um, again, I know it's controversial. I know that these things are unfair on farmers who are the ones that, or potentially anyway, beavers, it's definitely very harsh on farmers because they're the ones that are affected by this. Um, and, you know, people perhaps need to understand how much some people have been affected by this to the point of really, you know, risking losing their livelihoods from it. With lynx, there's been a lot of talk about the effects they might have. A lot of comparisons drawn, Janie, with Norway, which you might have read about, where there's been big problems apparently with lynx predation of sheep. Um, over there, they graze their sheep in the woodlands, um, which is very different to what we do here. And lynx are an ambush hunter, so they'll jump out and take things from cover. So grazing sheep in the woodland obviously presents them with quite an easy target. In all the other countries that they're in, in Europe, there's very little problem with them taking sheep. It's really just when they're grazing woodland that there's an issue. Britain obviously doesn't have that much woodland to start with, and we don't graze our trees, that, uh, sorry, don't graze our sheep in the trees. So will it be an issue? I can't see it being as big as some people make out. It's a very small animal, really. I think for the environment, again, it's something we have to consider because we have so many deer and we've proven so bad at controlling them that any kind of succession of vegetation is just being bitten off at the stem. So I think it's something we need to do. Um, wolves, I find hard to imagine happening. Um, I really do. I think it would just probably be too contentious for any of our lifetimes. Again, I mean, we all know um, there's plenty of evidence to show that there's massive wins for the environment from having wolves there. They probably would take a lot of sheep and there's no hiding from that, you know. Um, so, yeah, it would be a huge win for the environment, I'm sure. But I think in a country like Britain, which is so conservative in the way that we 
view the countryside that really invented modern farming and did such a thorough job of wiping out our predators. I find it hard to see it happening. So, yeah, that's a fudge, I know. <laughs> part of me would like it and part of me would be terrified about it and then the main part of me thinks it won't happen, so no need to worry about it for a time yet. Yeah. Um, what is the appetite among Scottish farmers generally to rewild their farms? How do they receive your approach and how are we doing as a nation? Oh, that's a good one. Um, I think there's a widespread fear of rewilding amongst most farmers. Um, I think most people view it purely about as being about lynx and wolves and bears, um, about being a bunch of people who perhaps don't even live in the countryside trying to make decisions that will affect farmers' livelihoods and no one else's. Um, so I think there's a big fear about it. And um, yeah, from our neighbouring farmers with the beaver thing, we've had a mixed response. Some have been fairly indifferent to it um, and some have been very opposed to it. Um, I think one of the things that's been difficult for me with it is that it's so hard to have a conversation about these things and to, you know, even get across the idea that beavers are going to reach all of our farms eventually anyway, and that by releasing them intentionally, while people might not like that, at least they would have advance warning of it, be able to discuss what problems might arise before they happen and be prepared to mitigate them. So, when beavers arrived in Tayside, there was no warning of them. They escaped from private enclosures and we've had a mess that's lasted decades as a result. On the plus side, we do have beavers back where they would never be before, but you know, people have only had the chance to react and not to be proactive. But I hope this would be different with this, but for some people, this is instantly becomes a case of another tree hugger who just wants to release beavers who doesn't care about farming and I think you know some people have just become so entrenched in this idea of what rewilding is and what rewilding people are that you know to to some people you just fall into a stereotype happily they're the minority though. Another question from Elaine and um, do you think there'll be any future projects and other schools that you will do? I'd like to keep the one going at the moment Elaine with um, the local primary schools in fact we would have probably done it um, last year had it not been for COVID, but it would be nice to get back out and um, catch up on the new primary ones and last year's primary ones, now primary twos, and make sure that they all get the bird boxes. Um, so yeah, I'd like to keep that going again. Um, where we go beyond that, I don't know, to be honest. Um, I would like to get more schools up here, particularly if we get beavers. Um, the headmaster of Dune Primary, where my daughter goes, has been hugely supportive of us doing this. So perhaps the idea of them coming out and seeing the habitats created by beavers would be a good next step and talking about some of the things um, that they can do for the environment would be quite a nice thing to do. Yeah, beyond that, I haven't thought much further. Um, do you have data on how the school bird boxes have done? No, I don't actually. Again, something that's been sadly interrupted by COVID, so the chances to go in and have a follow-up with them has been ruined by a global pandemic. I thought only a global pandemic can stop us from doing more with this, and sure enough, it arrived, and there we go. So um, I don't, but I get a lot of anecdotal um, evidence back from people saying that they have these birds emerging in their gardens, and it's been nice because a lot of them don't know even what the birds are, but they're reporting it back and it shows a good amount of engagement that, you know, parents, okay, maybe they don't know what a blue tit is, for example, but they're keen to know. And that's really pleasing, you know, hopefully, hopefully we've done a wee something that engages a couple of generations, not just the younger ones. That's been great, Tom. I think we've got time for one last question, Megan. Have you got another, have you got um, a cracker for Tom to end on? Well, there's one last one from Janie. Um, would you look to another country as a great example where they can balance their farming with rewilding as you are? Norway is usually held up as the big example, Janie, albeit, um, you know, for the links issue, it's um, sometimes held up by those opposed to rewilding as a problematic one, but they've got tens, if not hundreds of thousands of beavers in Norway. I think it's tens of thousands, actually, I better not over egg the pudding. Um, 
all sorts of birds of prey and carnivores, all sorts of things there in quite a similar landscape um, to Scotland. So there would be potential for us to do similar things. I mean, really, you know, if we could pretty much compare ourselves to most countries in Europe and find ourselves lacking. So we don't have to look far for inspiration. Beavers have been reintroduced successfully to 25 countries across Europe. Lynx have been reintroduced to several as well, and they're doing well. Wolves are back in highly populated countries like the Netherlands again. So anyone saying that Britain is too small for wolves, that there's too many people, we're actually, especially Scotland, a very sparsely populated country. It's more the conflicts that they would have with people in other senses rather than direct with human populations. I think we need to not worry about the big bad wolf stories and that knock on effect it has for other carnivores. So, um, and really just focus on what the real problems would be. So yeah, um, there's plenty of other countries that could give us plenty of good examples where we're willing to follow. Well, I think that's it for the questions. <laughs> I think that's a brilliant point to stop. Um, and that's been fascinating, Tom. We've given you a really good grilling at the end of that and you've given us amazing answers. And I hope, again, this has been another inspiring talk because the last two, we've turned into kind of our flow has turned into the flow of nature through the environment and what, how people can interact with the environment. And Tom, again, you have done as justice with your, your presentation. And it's been fantastic. And thank you so much for, for doing this when I know you've been so busy and for, manning, for manfully answering all these questions, some planted and some spontaneous, and it's been really good. So I just want to give you a huge vote of thanks for, for stepping up and helping us yet again. And hopefully next year we can do something face-to-face -face at Argety. So thanks again, Tom. Thank you, Anne. And before I forget, because I know that a couple of them are watching, could I just say um, a special big thanks to my mum, Lynn, for the photographs um, that she supplied for tonight, and also to Claire Hart, who supplied a couple of crackers for the talk as well. I knew I'd forget to say that, but yeah, thank no. you. Oh, absolutely. Our... Your life wouldn't be worth living if you didn't. So <laughs> again, cracking pictures, Claire and Lynn, thank you. Thank you very much. So... I think on behalf of everyone, I think it's time to give Tom a chance to go and get a, a drink of water and everyone to go and get dinner if they haven't. Thank you. Thanks, Tom. Thanks, Anne. And thanks, Megan. Thank you. Thank you.